it's a it's a complicated series of words that actually represent a fairly simple concept. Um, molecules move, the wind blows and water flows, uh, but when molecules get larger, uh, they have the ability to stick to themselves. Um, and that allows you to get larger assemblies of molecules that uh, are not bonded to one another, but stick to one another. It's like, it's like the pieces of a puzzle. They stick to one another. And the pieces of a puzzle, you have to manipulate to put them in place. But molecules have enough thermal energy to allow them to move, but they also are sticky enough so that they can stick to one another. As the molecules get larger and larger, then the force of sticking to one another gets larger and larger. So if you can super molecular assemblies are have to do with learning the rules of what the forces are that allow them to stick to each other to generate structures. So like generating a puzzle or like generating a house. If the if the bricks could move and could stick to each other in certain ways, then the house would self-assemble, would make itself. And that would be marvelous if we could have it make itself and not have to put in all the energy to make it. And and molecules do that. They have enough thermal energy to bump into one another, and if you can control where you put force constants, then they will make structures. And so that's the notion of supramolecular, you know, large molecules that self-assemble spontaneously. Most of the technologies that you talked about have to do with living systems in some way, and living systems are the prototypical example of supramolecular assemblies. Individual cells uh, are, will self-assemble. When they divide, they self-assemble. When the components are made, encoded on the genome, and made, they spontaneously assemble into functional entities. So learning the rules of self-assembly is really what evolution did through trial and error. They tried different molecular structures, and some of which gave function, and some of which did not. And one of the things that we're particularly interested in is how it is that those rules gave rise to functional entities. So the question really is how did evolution get started? How do we understand how molecules encode information and transfer that information to progeny? So if we could, if we could learn those rules, we could really start to recreate in different ways the marvelous machinery that have uh, evolved at, at a molecular level uh, in living systems. Uh, we could evolve it to do different kinds of functions. We could take some of the rules of biology and apply them, some of the rules of self-assembly, and apply them to things outside of the context of biology, which would clearly be functional entities which we could use for a variety of different applications. And that has caught the fancy of the public in the context of nanotechnology. It's a nanoscale elements of, of of machines and devices that are molecular in scale but have, have functions uh, that either replicate or extend those functions that we know about in molecules of living systems. If the concept of biology as being a, a self-assembly system, uh, then we know about a number of systems in biology that, that misfold, that make mistakes when they assemble. And there are dozens of diseases that are associated with misfolding events. So certainly if we could understand the rules of folding uh, or the rules of misfolding when they make mistakes, we would be in a position to, to correct that. So this would include diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and, and diabetes and cataracts. There are a number of diseases given the number of molecules that, that human, the human genome encodes. Uh, there are a number of opportunities for that to make mistakes. So understanding how they fold and how they make mistakes would set up ways that we can control that process. Uh, most infectious diseases are, are, are also, also dependent on the ability to assemble into functional entities. A functional virus is a self-assembly process that takes advantage of a, a, a cell, the machinery in a cell, to make itself. 
uh, if you could understand the process of how it makes itself, you might be able to interfere with critical steps at acute times in the life cycle of the virus to be able to control it. So the notion of understanding what the machines are, how those machines are made, sets up the possibility of understanding how to, how to control that process, and that would allow you to help control disease and help develop new pharmaceutical approaches for controlling disease. It is what living systems are. They are self-assembled systems. So understanding the rules allows us to really understand the very basis of what we call living, uh, what it is that allow things to encode information and to continue to grow, to get more sophisticated. And that really is, in a nutshell, that's evolution, to emerge spontaneously, uh, to make mistakes, uh, in, in the process of assembly or the process of copying that information and to be able to select for functional entities within that, within that array of different mistakes is really the, the basis of evolution. So not, not only could we learn about how living systems do it, but we could learn about how to, how to use it, how to use the process of evolution uh, effectively as a force to control the kinds of structures that we want to make. Anytime, you know, if, if, if you think about the language that I've been using, it is about controlling living systems. And anytime we think about controlling living systems, there are ethical issues that are associated with it. I mean, we have been controlling living systems f forever in, in terms of agriculture and domesticated animals and, uh, and in controlling disease states. Uh, but the notion of really being able to reprogram to change at a molecular level what it is that living systems do is, is certainly, certainly uh, will stretch our morality and, and impact our ethical choices about how we do it and what choices we make. So it's, absolutely that's true on every level. Uh, we, do have, we do have a good history, I think, of we do have mistakes, but we do have a good history of making choices. And I think the scientists, sciences have, have proven to be careful about how they, make, how they make these choices. And as long as this information is public, and as long as people know about what the choices are being made, as long as research is funded in a public way, then uh, we will collectively be able to make decisions about where we go and what we do. The, the danger is, I think, uh, is to not have the information, all the information, to, to make those correct choices. So education about what we're doing, the keeping it public, making sure that everybody knows what we know and what we don't know, uh, is the only way to make collective intelligent decisions. So I think it's very important that we are mindful of how research is funded, we're mindful about how it's published, and we're mindful about uh, assessing and evaluating the data that we have and, and trying to keep it separated from moral choices that, that we make when the landscape changes about how those choices, the, the information that we have to make those choices from. We're speaking of evolution. Darwin con was concerned about this in all of the books that he wrote about what this meant with respect to his faith and his religion and the morality of the choices that we, he was making and what this scientific understanding meant with respect to those choices and his concept of his morality. Uh, so I think, you know, scientists, uh, uh, scientists are people like everyone else. I mean, I think we're all in this to make these decisions. That's why the, the notion of communication is so important and the public uh, awareness and education it's so important for universities to do, the education of what the, what the information is, what the new understanding is, and what it might mean. Uh, but scientists have always been concerned about that information, and they always will be. You can define ecosystems on, on many different levels. Uh, you can define an ecosystem as being within a cell. There are many uh, millions of molecules that are self-assembling and organizing and controlling function within that cell the whole time in, in, a, in effectively a cooperative uh, machine on the one hand or an ecosystem uh, where they all work. That, that concept scales from the molecular level to the organismal level to the societal level. 
uh, and there are lessons that we learn that, that transcend each of those levels with respect to how the system operates, how we think about how it operates. Um, so certainly the organization that you see in schools of fish, the organization that you see in communities and cities, the organizations that you see are, are, are again, uh, not super molecular, but super organizable uh, communities. And, and the concept of, of uh, chaos, the concept of uh, organization, the concept of uh, coherence uh, ties all of these together, at least conceptually. Um, so I think the, the understanding that we gain from each of these link scales, if you will, uh, helps to inform the other. So when we think about the evolution of molecules, we think about the evolution of organisms because that's what we see, that's what we understand, that's the data set that we have. So and many times we try to recreate the concepts that we understand from organismal evolution at a molecular level. And we think about you know, evolution at an organismal level as we make choices, we choose spouses, we reproduce. Uh, that kind of thinking doesn't at actually translate to molecules so much. But the process, the process of organization, the process of assembly, the process of selection and adaptation certainly do apply at a molecular level and a societal level. Uh, it also makes it easier for us to think and understand and explain what happens on a molecular level, to use metaphors and analogies to systems, to macro scale systems that we understand at an organismal level. So the, the educational process of that is very, very important and the concepts I think do transcend in many ways uh, to help the learning, the understanding of how we think about evolution now at a molecular level when we really understood evolution at the beginning at an organismal level. We're at a fascinating time now where uh, we have the sequences of genomes of organisms are being, uh, are being defined and published uh, every day. Uh, each organism lives in an environment and adapts to that niche and his genome is a product of that adaptation. Understanding at a molecular level what it is that allows this organism to adapt and live in that environment uh, is absolutely fascinating, uh, but it does tell us the molecular blueprint of how that works in that context, in that environment. So there are individuals who are trying to, across biology and chemistry and physics, individuals who are trying to understand different aspects of how that system works. Uh, as we learn more about how evolution has occurred at a molecular level, we're in a position to start to define that in different terms, to understand the forces that control it, to understand the molecules that lie at the basis of it, and to test our understanding by making new systems and new molecules that, that adapt to those same functions. We have for a long time uh, developed a technology for being able to make the molecules that we need to make to test concepts, to make therapeutics, to, to make antibiotics, to, to extend those antibiotics. We're, 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 the exciting point that we're at now is to make molecules that, that represent the functions that we define as living. To represent at a molecular level a different kind of evolution that tests our theory of how evolution happened on planet Earth in the context of different environments. And I think there are people who are working in engineering and nanoscale technology, there are people who are working in chemistry and understanding the molecules that, that set the tone for how we understand evolution at a molecular level. And there are individuals who are working on defining genomes of individuals who have uh, bizarre and unexpected strategies and functions that allow them to live in the niches that they do. And all of that is, is coming into coherence at the same time. So biology, in many respects, is becoming a synthetic science. It's becoming, it's becoming a science where we understand enough about how it operates to be able to, to change it and to alter it and to re almost redesign it. And it puts into perspective uh, what likely happened on planet Earth that gave rise to the systems that we understand. It puts into perspective the limits, 
the physical limits in the, the planet that we live on that allowed that to occur. And it puts into perspective now other planets that we're discovering around other suns and what, what environment, what composition those planets have and what kind of structures may have started evolution on those planets. What's, what kind of living systems might have emerged and how do we think about this on a larger scale that's not just in effect the one data point that we have on planet Earth. And that becomes really exciting because now we are discovering new planets around new suns. We are understanding, starting to understand what the composition of those planets are. We're putting limits on what molecules do, what the forces are that gives rise to self-organization and self-assembly on planet Earth. And we are now in a position to extend that to think about what may be happening on other planets. So it's, it's a very exciting time. I think there are things that are being done interdisciplinarily across uh, many, <laughs> many different scales that are all converging to allow us to ask questions that we never could have asked before. I think we all we all wonder, right? And you know, the the time that you spend thinking about molecules and becoming a scientist allow you to to wonder on a different link scale. But but we all wonder. We're all fascinated by the things that go on around us all the time. <clears throat> and so the 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 fun thing about being a scientist is it does allow for being a chemist. It allows you to wonder about things that you can't see. Uh, but there are tools that allow you to define and understand at that level. So, so it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a remarkable occupation in many ways because, of the, because you do are able to think about things uh, but because of the training on, on scales that you wouldn't. But that's true, that's true of everyone. Everyone thinks about things in their own unique way because of their own unique set of experiences. Um, so the, the process of wonder, I mean, we start with as a child. And you know, it, 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 if you can find a job that allows you to continue to be a child, <laughs> then you, you can't do any better than that. So, so wonder, wonder is, uh, is a marvelous thing. And I guess I'd put that, one of the things that Emory University has done, I think, is created uh, an environment where the exchange of ideas across different fields um, uh, is is very easy. So the idea of collaborating with people across departmental lines who think about things and in, in, who get excited about things on a different link scale and different kinds of questions uh, allows you to wonder about the things that you're wondering about in different ways. Uh, so the collaborative nature of, of Science is the is the other very exciting opportunity. I think that we're having. the world is getting smaller, the communication is getting easier, the ability to talk to people who use different languages, who define things at molecular scale or an organismal scale, um, becomes simpler, becomes easier. Uh, and Emory has has done a marvelous job of catalyzing that process both within the institution and between institutions in the Atlanta region. Uh, and increasingly between institutions around the world. So it becomes, uh, it, 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 you do get stimulated by lots of different things and you do have to make choices. Um, but it's, it's a marvelous opportunity to be able to make those choices and to think about things on, uh, from perspectives that other people bring to the table that you never would have imagined or you never would have come to uh, on your own.